I am a big fan of UFC, and I really like ultimate marathon or ultra marathons. Now, if you're not familiar with that, an ultra marathon is basically anything longer than a marathon. And I'd like to say that I'm, uh, that's my favorite race because I'm not really fast, but honestly, I'm not that great even at ultra marathons. Let me tell you why UFC and ultra marathons are a really big deal to me. One, in an ultra marathon, it's not about who's fastest. It's ultimately about who's toughest. You see, the guy or the gal that starts off fast on a 30 or a 50 or a 100 mile race is probably going to end up at the hospital or worse, they're going to end up with three little letters next to their name, D-N-F, which stands for did not finish. The guy or the gal who starts off strong in an ultra marathon is probably not the guy or the gal who's gonna finish strong. And in the UFC, in the ultimate fighting championship, it's not about who can punch each other in the face hardest. It's not about who's going to get you in a chokehold. The UFC is all about who's the toughest guy or gal in the octagon. You see, it's about who can remain strong, who can stay smart, who can be calm in the midst of some really hard times and eventually make the move that will win the fight. You see, most of us, when we're in a struggle, when we're in one of these life or death circumstances, we understand ultra running. We understand what it looks like to run away. Some of us have this natural fight response. It's only natural, by the way, to have one of these two responses, the flight response whenever you're scared, whenever your life is on the line, or the flight response when you're scared or your life is on the line. This is human nature. Did you know that for a few of us, for Christians, there's actually a third option out there? And today, what I want to do, where I'm going to go with this sermon for just a second, is from Nehemiah chapter 6, I want you to see the third option when life throws a punch. The third option when you're in the octagon and you're getting kicked while you're down. The third option when you're on mile 45 and you've got uh, 55 more to go. And this third option, I want to challenge you. This is the option you and I should consider whenever life gets hard. Let me catch you up to speed if you're joining us for the first time from Nehemiah chapter 6. Last week, we saw some guys that were going to try to trick Nehemiah. They tried to deceive him to see if that would cause Nehemiah to tap out. And that doesn't work. So then they try to discredit, disgrace Nehemiah to see if that will make Nehemiah run away. And that doesn't work. So finally, they decide to try to use death threats. Whatever it takes, let's just get this guy to stop building the city of Jerusalem. But Nehemiah is a man who won't run away. Nehemiah is a man who won't tap out. Because Nehemiah has a vision from God And he is ready to put it all on the line to rebuild the city. Now, today, Nehemiah deals with an even bigger threat. This threat from last week comes from outside the city walls. This week, it comes from inside the city walls. This threat this week has to do with people that are close to Nehemiah. And now they're going to turn on him and they're going to stab him in the back. And I want you to see for just a second what it's going to take for this guy to handle the pressure. I'm convinced that God put Nehemiah chapter 6 in the Bible for us so that we could see what kind of man he is. Is he the kind of guy that's going to take the fight response? Is he going to swing a punch? Is he the kind of guy that's going to take the flight response? Is he going to run away? And Nehemiah chapter 6 shows us a third option. An option that Christians should consider when life throws a punch and hits you right in the face. Here's the first response that most people are going to take, and that is the response to stand your ground and to punch back. And take it from me, I totally get it. Because I'm a career warrior, and I understand that there are some times in life where you have to defend 
the things that are important to you. That's not what we're talking about in Nehemiah chapter 6. We're not talking about defending what's important to you, uh, sacrificing for your freedom. What we're talking about here is retaliating when you've done wrong, is getting revenge. That's the fight response that we're looking at from Nehemiah chapter 6. So we're going to start in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 10. You got a paper Bible? You can flip open there. But if you're following along in the Two Cities mobile app, the scriptures are right there in front of you. If we're not going to, if we're going to respond the way Nehemiah did, we're not going to retaliate. So let's see how Nehemiah responds when this internal threat happens. Nehemiah, starting in chapter 6, will begin in verse 10. And here's what the Bible says. This is Nehemiah speaking about the threats that he's dealing with when life punches him in the face. And he says, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deleah, son of Mehetabel, who was restricted to his house. Now, I'm going to pause for just a second because I don't really know anything about this guy, Shemaiah. There's almost no information in the Bible. So we really don't know why is Shemaiah restricted to his house. Is he unclean and not supposed to be around the other Jewish people? Maybe he's deformed and he's lame and he's not able to get out of his house. I don't know. Maybe he has coronavirus and he's socially distancing. Whatever it is, Shemaiah is not able to get out of his house. And so he sends a message to invite Nehemiah to come to his house. Now, apparently these two guys know each other. They probably know each other pretty well because of the kind of message that he sends. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 10. I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deleah, son of Mehetabel, who was restricted to his house. And he said, let us meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let us shut the temple doors because they're coming after you. They're coming to kill you, Nehemiah. And he makes it abundantly clear just how serious and how um, urgent this is. They're coming to kill you tonight, Nehemiah. So let's rush to the temple and let's lock ourselves inside the temple. This is a trick. It's a really tempting trick, though. Because Shemaiah is probably a friend of Nehemiah's. And Nehemiah probably trusts this guy. And Shemaiah claims to have some information about uh, some death threats, about some guys that are coming to kill him, and they're coming to kill him tonight. And so Shemaiah says, hey, Nehemiah, here's what I think you should do. We should, you should run to the temple. You should go to the temple for asylum. You should lock yourself in there. And this is a trap. Because if Nehemiah goes inside the temple and he's locked inside the temple, when those doors are locked, they're locked on both sides, inside and out, which means Nehemiah is stuck inside the temple and maybe the guys that are waiting for him are waiting in the temple. We don't hear that from the Bible today. But maybe this trap is designed to discredit a leader because Nehemiah knows the temple is reserved for the men of God, for the Levites, for the priests, for those religious leaders. Nehemiah is a governor. He's a politician. He's a general contractor that's rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, but he is not a priest. And this temptation, this trick is hidden in the guise of something spiritual. Hey, Nehemiah, you're a spiritual guy. Why don't you come with me and we'll go rush to the temple and we'll go hide in the temple. Shemaiah probably is one of those guys, one of those gals that is going to speak a false word to you. In fact, we find out today just what kind of a false prophet this guy is in just a second. And I just need you to hear it from me, Two Cities Church. There are people out there that will deceive you. There are people out there that themselves are deceived. And if you follow their advice, 
you will make a terrible mistake. If Nehemiah follows this advice, it will be a terrible mistake. How do you know the difference, Jeff, between following this advice? Because the guy says there's threats that are going to happen tonight if I don't do something. How do I know the difference? Well, the way that you know the difference is you test it against the Bible. And you see if what you're being challenged to do, what you're being asked, the word of prophecy that somebody's speaking over you, does that word line up with the Bible? Because if it doesn't, don't listen to it. If that word does line up with the Bible, maybe you should listen to it. But the bottom line is the only way to know the difference is to know the Bible. And to spend some time getting into the Bible and letting the Bible get into you. And Nehemiah doesn't fall for this trick. Nehemiah is not going to even allow a friend to stab him in the back and to put put him on the spot and discredit his ministry. All of us know what it's like to follow a leader who's let us down. Because leadership at its very essence is people following a guy or a gal who has a vision and we believe in the guy or the gal because we believe in the vision. And then the leader makes a mistake. Then the leader gets off track. Then all of a sudden, the person that we thought we were following or the vision that we thought we were following, it doesn't appear to be what we really thought it was. This hurts bad when a leader does wrong, when a leader stumbles, when a leader falls. It can hurt really, really bad. And my guess is you've been hurt by that before like I have. Listen, normal natural response in those circumstances is to criticize, is to point your finger, is to point out what they've done wrong. In other words, when you've been hurt by a leader, the normal response is to take a punch, to retaliate, to get back at this leader. We as a church, Two Cities Church, is not, we are not going to do that. We're going to be the kind of people that love folks even when they mess up. And we leave the results, the consequences for that mistake in God's hands. But we love them and we pray for them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we continue to follow them after they've messed up. Yeah, leadership carries a heavy weight with it. And when you mess up, it hurts bad. And what we are not going to do as the people of God is criticize, condemn, throw the first stone in Jesus' language. We're not going to be the person that fights or retaliates when we've done wrong because Nehemiah doesn't fight. Nehemiah doesn't retaliate. And notice what else else Nehemiah doesn't do. The first and the natural reaction is to dig your heels in and the fight response, to punch back when life throws a punch. The second reaction is to run away when things get tough. That's the flight response. Nehemiah doesn't take the fight option, but you'll notice what he says next. He also doesn't take the flight option. Check out what he says in in verse 11. Here's how Nehemiah responds to this trick of going into the temple to save his own skin. Listen to these words. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can I enter the temple and live? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Check this out. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated. Do as he suggested. Look at this word. Sin and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. You see what's going on here? This insider, this guy who's close to Nehemiah, this holy man who, by the way, might be a a priest. We don't really know exactly who Shemaiah is, but he certainly has access to the temple. So he can invite Nehemiah to come in. He can at least invite Nehemiah to run away because they are coming for you tonight, Nehemiah but it's a trick. And Nehemiah recognizes that it's a trick. 
Some Bible scholars believe what Shemaiah is actually offering Nehemiah is, Nehemiah, why don't you go inside the temple? Why don't you take over the temple? Nehemiah, why don't you become the high priest? Nehemiah, you're already the governor. You're already the political leader. Why don't you also become the spiritual leader of the land? And Nehemiah can see right through this trick because Nehemiah has been on his knees before God because Nehemiah has been in God's word. And he probably remembers what the Bible says in Numbers chapter 18. Because in Numbers 18, God makes it very clear, the temple is reserved for the men that God has selected, has appointed, has ordained to be his leaders. And for anybody else who goes into the temple and kind of does what those guys are supposed to do, this is a great sin in the Bible. Nehemiah says, I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to go step into this trap. I'm not going to save my own skin, listen to me, by sinning. And by the way, there are a lot of people, unfortunately, even Christians out there, that have this mindset, they have this ethic that I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do until it starts to get hard. You see, they would never steal food until they're starving. And then all of a sudden when they're starving, it's now okay to steal food. All of a sudden, that commandment that you should not steal, that doesn't apply to them anymore because they're starving. Or all of a sudden, now that their neighbor has done them wrong, they're going to turn around and they're going to do their neighbor wrong. All of a sudden, those commandments don't apply anymore. Those rules from the Bible don't apply anymore because it's dangerous or because it hurts. Nehemiah says, I'm not going to sin in order to save my own skin. That temple is reserved for God's appointed leaders. And I'm not going to take that place. By the way, in just a little while, later on this afternoon at 1.30 today at Gentian Baptist Church, Two Cities Church is going to do something very special, very significant for Christopher Poirier and for his wife, Rebecca, as we as a church come together and as God selects this man and sets this man apart for ordination, and he does it through the membership of Two Cities Church. This is a really big deal, and if you're able to and you live in our our, our neighborhood in our part of the country, I want to invite you to join us at 1.30 today at Gentian Baptist Church as we set apart Christopher Poirier for this holy ministry. Nehemiah is being tempted to save his own skin, and Nehemiah is being tempted to do it by compromising his convictions and by violating the word of God. Shemaiah is actually a double agent. See what it says up here on the screens? Shemaiah pretends that he's there to protect Nehemiah, but actually he's there to hurt him. He's going to use his relationship with Nehemiah and turn it around and stab him in the back and try to get Nehemiah at least to discredit him, to do something that a leader's not supposed to do and give him a bad reputation, if not to set a trap that will ultimately lead to Nehemiah's death. Shemaiah is a double agent that is using his role as a religious leader and turning it against Nehemiah. But still, Nehemiah doesn't run away because Nehemiah realizes this is a trick. And if you're like me, you should be asking yourself this question right now. How did he figure this one out? How did he know, because this looks really tempting, how did he know that this is a trick? And the answer to that question is that Nehemiah spends time on his knees in prayer before he makes an important decision. Jesus Christ also spent time in prayer with his father before he makes important decisions. Listen, if Nehemiah should spend time in prayer, if Jesus spends time in prayer, you and I really need to spend time in prayer before we make important decisions. Because what if Nehemiah retaliates? 
It harms his ministry. It hurts his leadership. What if Nehemiah runs away? It hurts the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. There's a lot on the line right now. And Nehemiah is being tricked by a false prophet. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to offend some of you out there. And you'll get over it. Or if you don't get over it, it doesn't matter because it's the truth anyway. There are really only two teams that people all across the planet are playing on. You're either playing on God's team or you're playing on Satan's team. Now, don't give me that malarkey out there that heaven doesn't want me and hell won't take me because they're afraid I'm going to take over. You see, it doesn't really work that way. Even people who don't realize that they're playing on Satan's team are still on Satan's team. I'm bringing this up to you right now because we have to ask the question, whose team is Shemaiah really playing for? He claims to be a priest. He claims to be a prophet of God. Hey, Nehemiah, I've got a word of God for you. And in reality, Shemaiah is playing for the opposite team. You see, there really are only two teams out there. And either you are totally committed to the to following King Jesus, either you are on that team, or whether you know it, whether you believe it or not, you are on the opposite team. And don't get mad at me for saying these things. These are Jesus's words. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus puts it this way. If you are not for me, if you are not with me, he says, if you're not on my team and totally committed to following me, you are against me. That phrase literally means, if you are not for me, then you are my enemy. And this will probably shock a lot of people who are watching this right now, because many people are saying, you know what? I don't mind Jesus. I don't have a problem with him, but I'm definitely not his enemy. Jeff, are you telling me that if I'm not passionately, totally following Jesus, that I'm his enemy? Well, I'm not saying that. This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is basically saying, there's no uh, other option here. You're either playing for his team or you're playing on the enemy's team. And maybe you're realizing right now that whether you even knew it or not, by simply ignoring Jesus, by going through your life like you don't need him, like it's no big deal what he did for you long ago go on a cross to pay for your sins and to make you right with God. By just living your life that way, you are on the enemy's team and he's got you right where, you want, right where he wants you. Today, before this service is over with, we're going to give you a chance to surrender to Jesus Christ, soul and body and future to surrender it all to him and to change from being on the wrong team like Shemaiah to being on the team that Nehemiah is on to being on God's team. Matthew chapter 12, go look it up. Jesus says, if you're not with me, you are against me. Or that verse can be translated, if you're not for me, you are my enemy. I am your enemy. We've already looked at two possible responses out there. And honestly, for people that are not Christians, it's really one of two and only one of these two responses. There are the people that will naturally dig their heels in, and because they're going to take care of number one, they're going to be the first one to throw a punch when life gets hard. That's the fight response. Then there are some people that when life gets hard, they're going to take Option number two, they're going to run away. That's the flight response. They take off like their hair's on fire when stuff starts to go bad. But did you know that there's a third option? And this third option is the option that Christians, you and I who are in Christ, should follow. If it's not retaliation, Jeff, and if it's not running away, then what is the third option? Well, here it is. In that blank on your mobile app today, I want you to type in the word rest, R-E-S-T. It's right here on the screens. You see what I'm describing for you today, what you're going to see from Nehemiah today is that he doesn't throw a punch. He doesn't retaliate. He doesn't take the fight response. 
He refuses to run away. He's the kind of man that says, you will not get me off track. I will not run away from my problems. That's what little boys do. Men don't do that. They stand there and they deal with their responsibilities. They handle their problems. He doesn't take the flight response. What he takes is the quiet response. He does what the Bible describes for us in the 23rd Psalm, when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but yet you don't fear. You have peace in the midst of the storms because you know that your God will anoint your head even in the presence of your enemies. Nehemiah can rest. He can leave it in God's hands. He can trust God in the midst of these terrible circumstances. Last verse that I want you to see today, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 14, says it this way. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they've done. Also, Noadiah and the prophetess, Noadiah the prophetess, prophetess and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. I don't know who these other prophets are, but now we've got a crowd of people. They've got this kill Nehemiah Twitter account going. There's an entire website devoted to how much they hate this guy. They've got monthly newsletters, and they're about to have a convention in Las Vegas this fall. There's a lot of people that want to stop this guy and will do whatever it takes, discredit him, disgrace him, death threats, whatever it takes to stop this guy. We have read from Nehemiah's prayer journal in the past, and multiple times in the book of Nehemiah, he has prayed, God, I'm struggling. I need you to remember me. God, I'm suffering right now. I need you to remember me. And basically, Nehemiah is asking, God, would you reward me for the hard work that I'm doing? Because this is what you've called me to do. And I'm trying to rebuild a city, and it's really hard work. Today, Nehemiah prays something very different He prays today that God would remember the people that are trying to hurt him. Look, basically what Nehemiah is saying is, God, I want you to punch in the face the guys and the gals that are trying to punch me in the face. God, I am trusting you with this. I'm not going to run away and I'm not going to retaliate. God, I'm going to rest in you and I'm going to trust you with what happens next because I believe that Jesus is my judge. I believe that God has my good in his plans, and I believe that God will take care of this thing in the end. So Nehemiah doesn't rush to handle it himself. In fact, Nehemiah tells us these people, and there's more than a few of them, God, you're trying to intimidate me. If you watched last week, I told you we were going to talk about that word. Then I got busy and I totally blew that word off. So let me just tell you what the word intimidate means. They're trying to scare me to death, God. They're trying to scare me into stopping what you've called me to do. And God, I'm not going to stop doing it. But I also know that this is dangerous and I'm scared. And I need you to step in and I need you to help me. Nehemiah does the unthinkable. Nehemiah trusts Jesus for justice. He leaves the results in the hands of God and doesn't take the flight response, doesn't take the the fight response. He shows us today the way Christians are supposed to react. You see, it's only natural for those people that don't know Jesus to either fight to protect what they fight, to take care of number one, or to run away when it gets hard. That's just natural. For Christians, we do something that is very unnatural. We believe that our God is big enough that he can handle our problems. And by simply trusting him and resting, knowing that he's got it under control, palm of his hand. We're proving to the world that our God really is good. He really does love us. Our God really is big enough that he really can handle these problems. And so we don't run away or we don't retaliate. We bounce back when life gets tough. Now, 
I have had the privilege of seeing as a pastor and as a chaplain, as a soldier in the army, I've had the privilege of seeing families that have gone through incredible hardships, gone through great suffering, and they've weathered it and they've bounced back. And it's blown me away how well that they have handled difficulties. And it's because there's something inside of them that is strong enough that it gives them the courage to deal with it without running away. It helps them to deal with it without trying to handle it all on their own. They trust it in God's hands and they leave it there. But probably the greatest example of this I've ever seen or read about comes from an author by the name of Jerry Sitzer. Sitzer and his family were at a big gathering um, in the Midwest, and on the way home, he and one of his children, they were driving in two separate vehicles because they had two separate things to, uh, going on. On his way home, wife goes with one vehicle, he takes one of his children in another vehicle, and his wife, get this, is hit in a head-on car crash by a drunk driver in this vehicle. His mother, his wife, and his daughter are killed instantly in this car crash. Jerry Sitzer writes a book about this and tells what it felt like to lose three generations of people in one car crash. The book is entitled A Grace Described, and he's raw and he's honest in this book. He says how angry he is that the guy who runs into them is way beyond the legal limit in alcohol. He survives the crash, but he loses, Sitzer loses his mother, his, his wife, his daughter in this crash. He talks about how he wants revenge and he wants this guy to suffer for what he's done to him. He talks about how he wants to run away from these problems that they're just overwhelming. He loses almost his entire family in one instant. And then Sitzer says something that's mind-blowing. He says that it's in the midst of this really terrible grief that he is faith is developed and grows in a way that it really wouldn't grow any other way. In fact, if you want to know how does a human being deal with that kind of tragedy all at once, the answer is in the subtitle to Jerry Sitzer's book. The book is called A Grief Disguised, and the subtitle says it this way, How the Soul Grows Through Loss. Sitzer deals with great struggles, great grief, and yet he's able to rest and to trust it with God because he believes, I'll see my family again. And although it hurts really bad, although I want to run away, although I want to get revenge, I'm not going to. I'm going to trust that in God's hands. Maybe today, from Nehemiah chapter 6, you've started to realize that although you, you haven't really done anything wrong, you're not really doing anything to harm the faith. You're not actually working against God. You're actually not on his team. And as I said just a few moments ago, by not being for him, you are automatically against him. Maybe the action step that you need to take in just a second is that you need to bow your soul and surrender to Jesus and turn it all over to him, to turn to team Jesus for the first time. I'm going to pray for you in just a second. Maybe you're watching this online, and you've been dealt a heavy blow by um, the economy. Maybe it's been a heavy blow because of a health problem. Maybe it's a finance or a family issue that's really, really hit you hard, and you're struggling, and you need prayer. In just a second, we're going to pray for you, but we're going to give you a chance to reach out to us and let us know what that prayer need is so that we can pray with you and pray for you about that need. But here's the thing that every Christian that's watching this should commit today that they're going to attempt to do by God's help, with, by, by God's grace, with God's help. You're going to try to rest in Jesus when it gets tough this week. You're going to try to turn it all over to him and trust him with the difficulties that you're dealing with, 
We call these things action steps because we believe when God wrote the Bible, he wrote the Bible not just to inform us, but he wrote the Bible to transform us, that he wants us to take what we've learned today from Nehemiah 6 and do something with it. So I'm going to say a prayer for you right now, and I'm going to ask that you would respond, not to me, not to this church, but you would respond to what you've heard from the Bible today. Let me pray for you right now. Father, I pray for people that are suffering, for folks that are really hurting right now. And because they're hurting, they have this natural reaction to take option number one and to retaliate. But God, they're realizing today that's not what you want them to do. I pray for people that are hurting, that want to run away from their problems, and they realize that's not what you want me to do. And so they're going to take the courageous step of resting and trusting and believing in you and believing you've got them in the palm of your hand, believing that you will take care of them and that you, you have their good in mind. So God, I ask that you would help your people to take this third option today and to rest in you when life gets hard this week. It's not going to be easy, but Holy Spirit, I believe that with you working inside of them, they can turn it all over to you, and they can trust you with it. Father, maybe some people are really struggling, and they need prayer. They want you, this church to pray for them. Would you give them the courage to reach out to us and to let us know this thing that they're struggling with? But God, more than anything else, I pray that somebody who's watching this today, maybe for the first time in their life, have realized I'm not really on Jesus's team. And if I'm not on Jesus's team, according to Matthew chapter 12, I guess that means that I'm on the wrong team. And today they realize that the enemy has them in the palm of his hand because they just live their life like it doesn't matter what Jesus did for them. Maybe right now, Holy Spirit, you would invade their home. Maybe right now you would come into their heart. You would start to poke them in the chest and say, hey, this is you, buddy, and you need to nail this one down once and for all. And maybe right now, watching this on their TV or on their tablet, they would surrender to you in a prayer of faith. There's no magic in these words, God. You know that. But if these words are sincere, I believe that you hear it from heaven. I believe that you can radically, totally transform somebody. They will go from dead in sin and in the hands of Satan to alive in Jesus Christ and um, your son or your daughter. So Father, right now, would you cause somebody to just simply reach out and pray to you and to ask for your forgiveness, to say, God, I'm a sinner. I've gone through my life making myself number one, putting myself on the throne, and I've really made myself God. And I've been thinking about me and taking care of me, and that's all that's been on my mind. So right here, right now, God, I'm saying, I can't fix this on my own. I need you to step in and to work. I need you to change me. I need you to clean me up. I need you to make me into a new person. Father, I don't really understand all that this means, but I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven and that he came out of the grave three days later so that I could have the promise of eternal life. And right here, right now, God, between me and you, I am turning from my sins. I'm trusting you for the first time. And Father, if that prayer is real, if it comes from a sincere heart, I'm asking that you would move into that home, that you would move into that heart, and that you would transform somebody and turn them around and make them into a new creature today. And then, God, would you give us the privilege of following up with them and explaining to them what, we, what the next steps are. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're joining us today for the first time, we've got just a couple of quick things to talk to you about. All of this information you can find in our mobile app. So if you don't have that app downloaded, here's a text message that you can send. It's on the screens in front of you. Send that text message to 77977 and you can download the app. All of this information is in that app. We want you to be connected with us. We want to be connected with you. You can do that by following us on social media. In fact, you would help us out by subscribing to our social media channels. But you can also stay connected to us by signing up for our email newsletter and our email list. You can sign up on our website. Just go to twocitieschurch.com and fill out that information at the bottom of the page. 
we really take doing life together, being honest and vulnerable and accountable to one another seriously. And so we want you to be connected to a life group. And in fact, I'm going to show you a short video about why this is such a big deal to us. Watch this video, will you? We'd love to help you get connected to one of our life groups. So if you want some more information about those groups, you can go to that button in our mobile app that says life groups. Every Saturday uh, for the last couple of weeks, and again this Saturday, we will meet together and serve together at Chase Homes. Uh, you can find out more information through our newsletter or through our social media channels. And if you're struggling and you need prayer, right there in that mobile app, there's a button that says, how can we pray for you? Or you can send us an email. Just put prayer in the subject block and send it to info at two cities church, the number two cities church.com. Hey, we're not meeting in person. So if you want to give, if you're giving your tithes and offerings to our church, you can do that online. You can actually send a check if you want. Our mailing address is on our website, or you can give through our mobile app. You can give through our website. You can even give by text message. Just text the number two in the word cities to 77977. Last thing that I want to say is if you have found us and you've started following us, would you let some friends and let your uh, family know about our church, if, especially if they're not connected to a church? Send them a text, send them a little message on social media and say, hey, check out Two Cities Church and maybe they'll connect with us next week. We're glad that you joined us. I hope that you have a great week. Thanks for being with us today and God bless you.